Well, Robbie, thank you for joining us. Good to have you with us again today. Nice to be back, Bob. I've been on the road for four weeks, so it's nice to be home. Not the most pleasant of topics that we're going to talk about today. Uh, atheism and belief has been in the news a lot of late. And uh, most recently, a story came out in USA Today that pointed out that nuns now make up 15% of the population. And nuns would be described as N-O-N-E-S. Those who, when asked for their religious affiliation, gave the answer, none. That's up from 8% in 1990, almost twice as much. As an evangelist, that must be quite disturbing to you. It is, and I've heard that category, and I think uh, at one stage, uh, <clears throat> Richard Dawkins had wanted to call them the brights. You know, maybe he still does. Those who are openly uh, in the positive vein of anti-theism or atheism, he wants to call them brights, which means the others are the not-so-brights. Uh, that's the category, but it's interesting uh, be very interesting to have a few of them around the table, uh, like Dawkins himself, when really pushed, 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 uh, will boil down to the agnostic position because he cannot have an absolute atheist position. So nuns, you may there may be a wide category. Some like saying I'm not into organized religion. I do have personal faith, or the other alternative is that they do have a religion and that's self-worship, a different brand of pantheism. So it's fascinating. It's sort of, quote, the coming out of the closet days because they were looking for a beacon to be their head and Dawkins now serves that purpose. Uh, every generation seems to produce somebody like that. Dawkins is carrying it in this age of social media to uh, many, many uh, extremes but it is a very fascinating and a telling uh, sign. I'm not quite sure whether they would all be to the same degree, but it does tell you they're not into any formal organized faith of any kind. The uh, USA Today article quoted a man by the name of Barry Cosman, who was a co-researcher of the 2008 American Religious Identification Survey. And in that article, he, he was quoted as saying, don't blame secularism for driving up the percentage. These people aren't secularized. They're not thinking about religion and rejecting it. They're not thinking about it at all. In a country where religion is so public, how do you explain that? He's kind of equivocating on the term, you know, uh, what does he mean, don't blame secularism? The very word seculum uh, in the Latin literally means this worldly. That's what it actually means, that uh, there is no world beyond, there is no outside input. And so when he's saying don't blame secularism, uh, I don't know whether he's saying that that ideology has not been the one that's driven them to this, but that's what secularism is. It ends up with the fact that there is no ultimate, infinite, personal God. This world is all that there is to it, to use the uh, scientific term, a closed system. Uh, what he is what he's really saying is they have no interest in the transcendent or in the sacred. They are living by it. The blame, that is a completely different. So he's actually fusing two questions into one. Um, it may be, you know, I think the world has changed since 9-11 in many ways, not just socially, not just economically, not just interculturally. It has changed in terms of people's view of religion as a whole. And sometimes they lump all religions into one and say these guys are bent on destroying civilization as we know it. Uh, they never give a fair test to atheism at the same time. But uh, the fact of the matter is, what he is concluding is that there are many, many people who are not interested in a structured form of religion anymore. So they're not necessarily rejecting God or not thinking about him. It's the institution they're not happy with. No, and it's interesting. You know, uh, just as I left home this morning before coming here, I've been gone for four weeks. Uh, on my desk, I saw the latest Newsweek issue. And the headline, I haven't read it. It's by Andrew Sullivan. Uh, it said something about to forget God, but follow Jesus. So I don't know what his uh, what his stake is on it, interestingly coming from him. But again, it seems to be this bifurcation. Uh, somewhere in the 80s, Bob, I began to get a sense that the more religion became commercialized, the more we were going to flirt with uh, making it a target that would be attacked because we marketed it rather than proclaiming it. And uh, any time it invades in the political arena or the commercial arena, there will always be those who question the integrity of its message. So I'm not sure 
that the numbers would follow the same way if they said, what do you think of Jesus Christ? As they would, what do you think of organized religion? I think the people see it in two different ways and quite legitimately sometimes. That's a, a bit more hopeful outlook. I think of Pascal who wrote that we all have this God-shaped hole in our being and only God can fill it. If indeed you have that many people and that increasing number of people walking around, they must be unhappy and, and unfulfilled in life, aren't they? You know, in the last trip, I covered four stops. I was in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in Thailand, and in Hawaii. In Hong Kong, I was speaking to the YPOs, the Young Presidents Organization, and in um, uh, Hawaii at the state prayer breakfast. The state prayer breakfast drew over 2,000. The two nights before that, University of Hawaii, which was in an overflow crowd. The, I began this trip one day before my, I began the trip at Clemson, nearly 9,000 or something, the largest attendance uh, outside of a sporting event. Um, and the attendance of the prayer breakfast, the fascinating thing is people are hungry. There is no doubt about it. Anybody who thinks there's no hunger is just not revealing the facts as they actually are. So Pascal is right. There is a God-shaped vacuum. But with these tremendous attacks from a rabid secularism, a kind of an attractive uh, spir spirituality without God, the collapse economically, the geopolitical maneuverings in the name of religion, all of these have had a role to play in disillusioning people. But somewhere in the deep recesses of our own thinking, we don't like the feeling of being left alone. None of us does. And we want a voice from somewhere. And the least they are saying in coming to these meetings is, is there legitimacy to this? You please tell us. The fact is that the mainstream of humanity will not be affected by things like this. The number of bellmen in the hotel we were staying in Hawaii, the number of taxi drivers who talked to me, they all are searching. They will all talk to you about what this means. It is the elite in certain segments of society politics, entertainment, and the academy, who seem to be heard the loudest, but they are not necessarily voicing what the undertow is for the mainstream of humanity. There's an incredible hunger. They've lost confidence in political leadership, and who can blame them? The shenanigans that go on in political leadership today and the nonsense that sometimes goes on in religious leadership as well. But then you come to Good Friday and then you come to Easter and you see the tens of thousands all over that have a remarkable expression, speak, we're listening. They really want to hear. One man at the University of Hawaii who was an atheist came up to me afterwards and he said, the only thing that bothered me tonight is that you didn't do a Q&A. And I said, I wanted to, but the organizers said they had not taken the auditorium long enough. It is just for the talk. What was he saying? I want to interact with you on these things. So it's a, it's a partial glimpse, I think, Bob, you know, and when it's made to look like this is the homogeneous expression of mankind, it's just not fair and it's just not true. That hunger that you described uh, speaks to something else that Pascal said in that same comment was that people would try to fill that void with everything around them, and they would try, in many cases, in vain. Yeah. That's a perfect example of our culture, isn't it? You know, it was years ago uh, when you and I talked about the issues we wanted to discuss. I, I went back to one of my books on this, and uh, this, uh, this quote actually came from Malcolm Muggeridge. I think it'll be good for the listener to hear what Pascal actually said, so let me read it for you. My younger days, I memorized it and used to say it, but here it is. It is in vain, O men, that you seek within yourselves a cure for your miseries. All your insight only leads you to the knowledge that it is not in yourselves that you will discover the true and the good. The philosophers promised them to you and they've not been able to keep their promise. They do not know what your true good is or what your true state is. How then could they have provided for you a cure for the ills which they have not even understood? Now listen carefully. Your principal maladies are pride, pride which cuts you off from God and sensuality which 
binds you to the earth and they have done nothing but foster at least one of these two maladies. If they have given God for you for an object, it has been to pander to your pride. They made you think that you were like him and resemble him in your nature. And those who have grasped the vanity of such pretensions have cast you down into the uh, other abyss by making you believe that your future is like that of the beast of the field and have led you to seek your good in lust, lust, which is the lot of animals. Brilliant insight. And so you're talking a couple centuries ago plus where Pascal is really saying that the two extremes, either self-deification or total abandonment into sensuality, he's, that's exactly what we are seeing self-deification and pantheism or this sense of give up all restraint and treat your bodies as the only thing that really matters and if that's all there is to it they've led you to seek your good in lust which is a lot of animals he says Pascal's insights were so real. Uh, when I was speaking in Hawaii, uh, I quoted uh, Queen uh, Lily Uokalani, who in 1917 said there were two extremes in every culture, two kingdoms warring, one that wanted an antinomianism, no law, no restriction of any kind, total abandonment, and the other was sort of an over-restrictive, legalistic type that controlled every facet. She said, either of these two extremes are dangerous. Look at what we are doing now with total accommodation, the desacralization of all, or you end up with an enforcement of kinds violating the conscience of people. The, the, the balance in life is the hardest thing to find. God gives us a law for a mirror, but he never ever forced us to comply against the will, but he warned us if we violated, the entailments will be obvious. To get people back to the middle for the pendulum to swing, is it the problem of the church? Is, does the message have to change? What do you think it is? I don't know. Uh, if the message has changed, it can be compromised, and I think some of them have tried it. The so-called emergent church has tried it. I think they'll be sorry if they compromise too much. There's no substance left. And then in other forms and other reaching other cultures, we've got the so-called insider movement, you know, give up all the substance of the gospel and think you'll win them over. What are you winning them to? You're winning them to the redefinitions, cast in the image of their own desires. There is the counter perspective of God. No, we do not need to change the message, but I do think we need to think seriously of how poorly we have done in hearing the questions, how poorly we have done in answering the questions, and how careful we need to be in navigating this terrain. Because wrong words and wrong perceptions can have catastrophic ramifications for the message. Jesus Christ was tough on people who thought they had all the answers when weren't living it. He was very gentle with those who had violated it but were genuinely seeking for answers, like the woman at the well, like the woman with the alabaster on me. And he was tougher on Nicodemus, who he said, you ought to have known these things. What, what is it you've missed out here? The church, I think, has become distant from the locations of discussion and has become distorted in, in pursuing power and structure. So uh, we, we've got a tough job, we've got a tough road ahead of us. However, in the West, while it is becoming tougher and tougher in some parts of the world, it is more open. It's a mixed bag. Uh, one of the first messages we aired on Let My People Think years ago uh, was your, your classic message, A Nation in Decay. And we've aired it several times now. And, uh, in that message, you raise four points about the fall of Judah. Evil influence, unconscious decadence, willful negligence, and ungodly impudence. Uh, do these findings on America's spirituality suggest that our decline is speeding up? It seems that way. Um, and but that, yeah, that's a very old message, probably sometime in the 80s. I've never, I haven't repeated that one for some reason. Um, Maybe because of our culture, you know, you come out with something like that and they'll think, oh, oh, here comes a revivalist or something like that. But if you take all of those points from the evil influence, the willful negligence, you know, and ultimately to the ungodly impudence side of it, uh, yeah, we are. And I think, uh, I don't know who it was I was talking to yesterday, yes, uh, to a very senior official of one of the uh, big companies in our uh, nation today, a man, a very godly man, 
uh, but a man who sees the challenge in the corporate structures today. And I said to him, you know, the Tower of Babel is being rebuilt in front of our own eyes. And this time it's not out of concrete, it's electronically done. It's done in the airways. We're all speaking the same language. And you run the risk and the ire of the media if you critique the media, question the media, and you ask them why it is they are so distorted in the way they do things. I think all the way from the political landscape down to uh, our academics, uh, we're, we're spreading a lot of lies. A lot of untruths. We know how to manipulate emotions. Um, I don't know how many times I have to ask people, do you know that to be true? Or are you just saying it? Do you really know that to be true? Uh, and, uh, you know, the battle of uh, uh, distorted stories, distorted facts, distorted implications, uh, People are uh, dispensing information that is absolutely unverified, editing tapes while putting them on the air. And this guy, you know, Malcolm Muggeridge warned of this. He was in the media. He told us that the lie is stuck like a fishbone in the throat of the microphone. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn warned us of this a generation ago, that this is what we're going to see. And of all places now, America, I think, is playing the lead in this, right from the battles we are fighting politically to the battles we are fighting academically. And then the courtesy of people like Richard Dawkins and all with their huge marches and all of that. We are flirting with the total decimation of a culture, total decimation of a culture. And I don't think we realize how sad it is and how serious it is. Interesting you should mention Richard Dawkins. Uh, and the last point that you made in that Nation for Decay message on uh, ungodly impudence, you quote from Hosea 9-7. And let me read part of that. It says, the prophet is a fool and the spiritual man is mad. So you're pointing out that the prophets go to the people and those that are opposed to the message call them fools and mad. And they do it as, so as to uh, negate the message of God making its way to the people. Just in March, uh, Richard Dawkins and others were on the mall in Washington, D.C. for their rally for reason. An atheist march, 10,000 showed up. And Dawkins told the crowd they should ridicule religious people. Let me quote him. He says, mock them, ridicule them in public. Their beliefs are insane. Therefore, they should be ridiculed with contempt. It appears he's reading from an old script that goes all the way back to Hosea, isn't he? You know, <clears throat> when I when I heard that and read this, I was uh, I read it hours before my talk at the University of Hawaii, and um, interestingly, that the University of Hawaii has one of the leading departments globally on world religions. Some of the finest minds, years gone by, used to use some of their writings and so on. I began my talk by saying I support what Dawkins says, that we should ridicule people with religious belief. And I would recommend that he begin that statement in Saudi Arabia <laughs> and let him start. And the audience just roared, you know, so there was maybe nasty comment to make. He is really complimenting this society of Christians by saying things like that because he can say it with impunity. I dare him to go to Saudi and do that. I dare him to go to Iran and do that. The least he will find out is that not all religions are created equal. So to make a statement like that, he reminded me of two other things. I remember as a youngster, I think I mentioned it in one of my books. I was in the city of Nagpur. I was in my 20s or early 30s preaching. And I saw a crowd gathering. And uh, I wondered what was going on. And people were laughing and, and slapping each other on the back. I gathered around to, I thought some magician was doing his tricks. It was an insane man. Mm. It was a man who was unclothed, literally with stones and stuff, scratching himself, dancing, behaving in a sad way. And I remember my eyes filling up with tears. And I'm saying, I thought to myself, is this really some form of entertainment to laugh at a madman? If he's telling us our ideas are insane, what does mocking do? If it's an insane idea, what does mocking really do? But there's something deeper with what he is doing philosophically. Two things. Number one is this. 
He goes on in endorsing a most recent book that has been written that we now have the answer how something can come from nothing. And it's this age old rehashed quantum vacuum that uh, out of which pops up some kind of uh, 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 particle that, you know, can be can explain the existence. First of all, it's a misuse of what a quantum vacuum is. No quantum theorist actually tells you that a quantum vacuum is nothing. It's not no thing. There is a pattern. There is the subatomic activity that is going on. So it's not nothing. But suppose it is nothing, meaning no thing whatsoever. What does that do to atheism? I thought atheism's entire definition was everything that is is matter. It is a materialistic framework from start to finish. But if the starting point is nothing, then it's not a materialistic framework, it's nothing. And if you're starting from nothing to explain everything, then why not end up in nothing, including meaning? So who's to be mocked here? He's the one who wants to talk about the wonder of beauty and all of this coming out of nothing. That's the insane idea then. That's the thing that needs to be mocked. He's making something out of nothing, making it appear to be nothing, out of which he wants to build everything. It violates the very fundamental starting point of atheism. So even if he is taken practically, I dare him to do it in a counter perspective like Islam. If he is doing it equivocatingly, then it is not nothing, it is something. If he's mocking something insane, then the insanity actually lies on the side of the mocker. Everything he calls for there violates reason. But this shows you who Dawkins is. He is driven by hate. And that's why many respected atheists want to separate themselves from him. Even secular thinkers took issue with that statement of his and called him to task on it. Dawkins is an angry man and one day that anger will catch up with him. In a world of civility, you do not mock a counter perspective. You dialogue with a counter perspective. You mock a counter perspective. You provoke the basic, inst baser instincts in a human being. And somebody violent out there will want to get even with a comment like that. He's playing a very dangerous game. I was reading an email this morning from one of our Let My People Think listeners to you, uh, pointing out that uh, when they when they present the gospel to atheists, as they put it, they're attacked by a pack of vicious, rabid dogs. Mm -hmm. So it's already happening. So what would you recommend to people who find themselves in a position where atheists are mocking them in this way? Yeah, you know, uh, once upon a time, uh, all of my answers would be very ironic, very warm, very cordial. The older you get, you tend to, tr you tend to react. And I'm not sure it's the wisest way, you know. I also have to back down some time and saying, is this really a shouting match? What is the end in sight we, we, we desire? Are we desiring the winning of the person or the decimation of the person? We are seeking the winning of the person. Let me give you an example of this. I may have used this at some time. I was speaking at the uh, University of um, Malaysia, or I think it's called Malaya. It's the oldest Islamic university in Malaysia. And a professor of geology, he's a Christian gentleman, came to me and he told me this story. I wish I could remember his name. It's something like Gentle Lee or something like that. Very fine man. I'm talking several years ago. He took me out for dinner. He said, Ahmed Didat, the Muslim debater who's passed away from Durban, South Africa, who was taking on all comers. He came to speak at that university and he mocked the Christian there. And this gentleman stood up and he said, why are you mocking Christianity? And the man said, because it's a farce. He said, nobody can live the Sermon on the Mount. So he, Professor Lee said to him, why do you say that? He said, come on up here. So Professor Lee walked up to the front and the man, uh, the man slapped him across the face. Ahmad did that, slapped him across the face. He said, turn the other cheek now. And Professor Lee told me, he said, Ravi, my face was ringing with that slap. And I turned the other face, turned the other cheek to him. He said, did that, didn't know what to do. The audience was packed. He said, all right, I won't go that route. But the Bible also says if a man asks you, uh, ask you for your tunic, you know, give him your cloak also, whatever. He said, take your trousers off for me. 
And L Professor Lee told me this himself. He said, I looked at the audience, many of my students in there, I said, please forgive me for doing this. And he took his trousers off and was standing in front of the audience in his under underwear. And Didat was just mocking and laughing at him. And then he picked up his clothes, walked out of there. He said, Ravi, my office was lined up with Muslim students the next day, begging for forgiveness for what was done to me. And you know, this kind of nonsense that mm, mm, Dawkins is propagating is exactly the kind of stuff has been tried. It's nothing new. And you really end up looking foolish when you mock somebody's faith like that. There are many beliefs in the world I do not agree with, but if I were to encourage people to mock the person the way he is calling for it, here's the point. In the Christian faith, there's an egalitarianism of people and an elitism of ideas. People are equal, ideas are unequal. Let ideas be pit against each other, but don't take away the egalitarianism of the person. Don't rob the person of his dignity or her dignity. Take the idea, take it to its logical outworking. That's not mocking it. That's reasonably interacting with it. But if you're mocking an idea, you're, you really don't mock an idea. You mock a person. Because the idea doesn't care if it's being ridiculed. The person does care. And I think Dawkins is on a wrong track. And I think sooner or later, he'll take a back step and try to recast this in exactly what he means. But the true ideas that he has really are to mock people and denigrate them. This from a man who studied in an institution where the motto was, who taught an institution where the Lord is my light. And if they had mocked him, they would never even have given him the position to teach. He ought to return the compliment by showing respect for people who disagree with him. In a world of hate, mockery will engender more hate. And if that's the world he wants, that then tells you what his brand of atheism actually is. One outspoken Christian who's bound to get a lot of this ridicule is uh, NFL quarterback Tim Tebow. Okay. He's recently traded from the Denver Broncos mm -hmm. to the New York Jets. And as one Washington Post uh, writer pointed out, that's like dropping a Christian amongst the lions mm -hmm. because of the nature of New York. Uh, funny comment, but probably not too far from being false. I know you work a lot with professional athletes. Uh, what would you advise Tim Tebow and what he's about to face there in New York? And there are many amongst the lions too in Detroit. You know, I have, I have some good friends. Uh, um, the, the place kicker there, a marvelous, uh, tremendous um, uh, Christian and many others and so on. I won't take the noble liberty of naming them without their permission. But there are many Christians in the NFL, many Christians in the NBA, and, you know, uh, so it goes. Um, many Christians in the MLB, you know, I've spoken at some of their chapels as well. Tebow's a very unique guy, you know. Let's not recast him in everybody else's image. If he wants the liberty to get on his knees and pray and God gives him all the success, so be it. If he doesn't do as well as he anticipated, my prayer is God will protect him from the predators. Isn't it interesting? Joe Namath came out and lampooned Tebow. You know what, if I, if I want my kids to have a hero, it wouldn't be Namath. I would rather them follow who Tebow is. And then of course, you've got Jeremy Lin, uh, you know, from the uh, New York Knicks. He survived it and he is quite outspoken and he said uh, Tebow is one of his heroes. Here I think is the point we want to make. If a man or a woman has the liberty and the desire to propagate what they believe, interact with them on it. Let them, let them have that freedom to do it. These battles, I think, have always been there. They are now getting big front lines because of the media in which we are. If you know Christ, you follow him. Understand your audience, how best to communicate with them. Don't let them rob you of the truth by which you need to live. Just understand the best way in which to communicate it. And I'll tell you what, there are people out there in the darkest moments of their lives who will be calling for the Tim Tebow's of this world and those of you who stand for the truth and not those whose lives have already been wrecked. God is the healer and the one who puts life together. And I want you as a listener to make sure you understand him and what he wants to do with your life. 
the hostile and the antagonist will always be there. This is not new. They sent Christ to the cross for a reason, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Robbie, thank you very much. Thanks, Bob.